Okay, yes. So uh, the next step in our operating systems class is uh, the memory manager. Um, so we have so far handled process manager mainly uh, and threat management, that stuff, deadlock synchronizations. Uh, and now the next topic is also very crucial uh, as the processes actually live in memory. So we will now learn about it, talk about it and learn <clears throat> hopefully something nice and useful for you. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, memory is important uh, because the pro a program must be brought into memory to run in order to run. It sits in your disk uh, uh, normally. So you don't lose your uh, Microsoft Word, for instance, when you shut down your computer. But when you double click on your Microsoft Word uh, icon, then it becomes a process. And now it is no longer on disk. OK, it is brought from disk to the memory. So uh, and then the CPU will talk with that memory, not with the disk directly, which is a faster mechanism. Uh, yeah, actually, I am talking about it. Main memory and registers are only storage CPU can access directly. So registers are also storage elements that are uh, in the vicinity of CPU physically. So they are much faster than memory access. And memory access is also much faster than the disk access. So there are trade-offs. Registers are less capacity so you can't store everything in a register so everything should be in memory and the current instructions uh, that need to be executed they use the registers for the computations uh, yeah, it is like one cpu clock cycle like the fastest it can be uh, a register access whereas a memory access is uh, a couple of CPU cycle clock cycles. Yeah, actually, it, it is also written here, so I am not reading it. Uh, yeah, maybe I should also double check what I say. It is also written here. Uh, and there is also this cache business, which is another type of memory. It sits between the main memory uh, and the CPU registers. So uh, it is. Uh, the speed of cache access is in between the memory access and the register access. Cache is uh, more uh, fat, so you can keep more stuff in your cache than your uh, registers. Uh, yeah, but it is, again, not as big as the main memory. So the instructions that are executed and the data that it is that it is operated on, that is operated on, is stored in the cache for quick access. Uh, uh, it looks like the caching mechanism of your browser. So your recently accessed web pages are over there, which makes access quick. Mm. Uh, we also can see the big picture with the picture itself. Uh, so this is the disk where the pr programs sit in the beginning. When you activate them, like run them in terminal or using some mouse clicks or hit enter, whatever, uh, you run it. And now it is a process. It is called a process, which is an active entity. Uh, and this active entity is now in your main memory. And you put the current instructions uh, there is only one current instruction, but maybe also um, a couple of more into your cache. Uh, and from here, you talk with the CPU through registers. And when you need some data, you go get it from the memory. And uh, yeah, so you, CPU doesn't directly talk with the disk. Okay, so this is one important thing to notice. 
And by the way, the operating system itself is always in main memory because it is an active entity, right? It is constantly running, even at this moment we are talking about. It is doing some uh, 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 some socket uh, handling, some network listening, uh, and uh, other things that keep your system uh, proper. So when the code is generated by the compiler, or if you write an assembly code, then you already have the instructions. Uh, so what we do is actually we use memory addresses for variables, uh, functions, and uh, jumping, branching stuff. So those addresses can be either physical uh, or logical. Okay, so physical addresses uh, are uh, so actually the, uh, they they can be discontinuous. So this is your uh, physical address space on the right hand side. We have these blocks. Uh, but for instance, for the next instruction, it doesn't have to be the neighbor of the current instruction. Okay, this is just uh, in the like the linked list logic. These are like your nodes. And they are connected, uh, not with the next pointers, but they are somehow connected. Uh, and the logical address space is given to each process. Okay, once you have a process in your hand. Uh, and it is a continuous block of uh, bytes, okay? So we have this virtual address space, we have this text, the instructions here, then comes the data, the global variables, etc. Uh, and also we have this stack, which is like, as your functions call other functions, we keep that information in a stack to return to the most recent called function once you are done with the function. Uh, also, we have some memory allocations, the heap is growing, etc. So anyway, so we uh, the main point here is we have this block of consecutive uh, entries, okay, which is in your virtual space. So each process is given its own continuous logical memory space. In other words, it has its own view of memory with its own address space. Uh, and later on, we will see that we actually divide these addresses into fixed size pages. Okay, uh, so we will talk more about pages later, but uh, here are some spoilers about that. Uh, we uh, so paging is about uh, putting programs, uh, sorry, processes part by part to your memory okay because sometimes they will not be able to fit into the memory as a whole but actually the reality is you are at a given time executing only some part of a process that's why uh, paging allows you to do that without paging you have to maintain some kind of fragmentation in the background and extra work to uh, to fragment like to segment the unused parts and the used part, okay? So you need to uh, make room available because you will not be able to consecutively allocate uh, that block for a given process uh, without fragmentation. But if you do that fragmentation, then you collect all the empty holes into one big hole. Now you can fit your process into that, that big hole directly as a whole. Again, this is happening without paging. Uh, with paging, you don't have to deal with that fragmentation issue. Also, since CPU translates logical page-based addresses to physical frame-based addresses, there is no need for the physical frames to be continuous. Yeah, so this is actually what we have seen here. Uh, the block of logical memory is called a page, and each page is fitting into a frame, which is a block of physical memory, okay? So frame is in the physical memory, page is in the logical memory. And the size of the page and the frame doesn't have to be the same. In general, frames are larger. 
so if they hold multiple pages, uh, yeah, but this is the logic. A page goes to a frame. And two consecutive pages here in the logical address space of a process can go to two totally unrelated places. As long as you keep these pointers, and by you I mean the operating system, uh, you are good to go. So with an example, uh, you have a variable which is, after all, sitting physically. It's uh, something in our lives. It is physically stored in memory, maybe in this weird address. Uh, so it will sit there, OK? However, the logical address space of that variable changes during the execution of the uh, program. So for instance, it can be, so this is different from what physical address is, okay? This is the message of this slide, not have to, okay? Uh, here, you can also see that here, assume physical addresses in use. Uh, so, and now, now I will show you why do we need this logical address space business, okay? So why don't I just do everything with the physical addresses? So it won't be a problem. There is no problem. If you have a, a single process to deal with, then the addresses, so we have these instructions uh, put into uh, this, which makes this program or process. You can directly map it to your physical address space. Okay, so the uh, instruction at index 12 is really at index 12 in the physical address space. So we have this continuous block and I also have it here. Uh, so as long as your process is less than your available RAM, your physical memory size, then you are good. Uh, however, prob problem, problems begin when you have two parallel programs, two or more. So in this example, even two will fail your word. So what is the problem here? Uh, I put this program first from zero to 12. Then I put this thing here. But the problem is within this program, for instance, I have this jump instruction to the 12 index 12. However, if I physically put it here, then if you go to index 12, you will hit this add instruction, which is nonsense to this program, okay? It is just weird. Because what you really need to do is to do the compare in this slot. But it is now currently in 28 index. So it is very confusing. You can't keep track of this. So that's why we cannot just rely on physical addresses, okay? We need logical address spaces. Uh, so without any logical addresses, it's, if you go only with the physical addresses, then we cannot have a multi-programming environment. As you can see, two programs cannot even survive. Uh, we cannot load a program to an arbitrary position. Yeah, which is also a problem because the instruction, especially the jump instructions, will tell you to jump to some instruction at a given index, at a given location, and that location will probably not match uh, with location in the physical memory. So uh, your programs will suffer basically. And actually, bad enough early systems were using this idea. So they were not um, quite uh, multitasking as you may realize. Currently, we don't have that issue. Currently, what we have is uh, this logical uh, address sync, logical address space concept. So a program uses logical address space, okay? Uh, so uh, a logical address space has to be mapped somewhere in physical memory, which is the main memory. So again, we have this logical address space. I put this program, uh, so currently don't worry about the paging, framing, that business. So let's stick with this easier solution. I put this program as a whole into another location within the physical memory, okay? So 
it can be anywhere here. Uh, there will be the uh, from zero to logic max. So whatever the size here, I get exact uh, size in the physical memory, and they have to be. It has to be free uh, completely uh, consecutively. Okay. Uh, so actually, I think we, I hope that we have a slide about it. So if, for instance, you have 36 bytes here, okay, I need 36 bytes, but I have five bytes here, then another program here, then 10 bytes here, then another program here, then uh, 11 bytes here, okay. So in total, I have 11 plus 10 plus 5. Uh, it is uh, 26 unfortunately so let's assume that we have 26 bytes here uh, but even if you have 26 bytes around you wouldn't be able to start this program okay because you need that 26 bytes consecutively ready for you so that is called fragmentation we have talked about in the beginning uh, operating system from time to time triggers this module to shuffles the places so that that uh, distributed 26 bytes uh, is now uh, fragmented as a one block uh, and now you can put the program over there okay uh, so with logical address spaces without paging we have that problem we have to deal with that in the background which is very inefficient uh, now let's learn more about these logical addresses. It provides multi-programming environment because again, this program goes here and uh, with its instructions accessing the stuff within the physical memory using these base uh, base pointer. Okay, so for instance, if if it wants to access the eight location here, here it will do base plus eight, okay? Because base is already known. So if base is zero, if you put it here, then it will really be eight here, but maybe you put it in 120, then after to execute jump eight, you will actually jump into 128. Okay, so this base pointer is very important and the limit, uh, actually base is an index, so not a pointer, it's an integer. Limit is another integer, which is basically the size here, okay? Which is logic max minus zero, logic max. Uh, yeah, so you can use many programs as long as they fit as a whole to, a, to memory. Uh, and also you can relocate your code. Uh, so you can put your process your code the instructions that make your process to anywhere as long as they are coming as a block so then i need to make some conversions right i have some logical address in my instruction set i will convert it to physical address and it is as simple as this addition okay it is not a big deal uh, and logical address space is bound to a physical address space now after this conversion so an example I don't know why I kept them very small here, so let's see it clearly. Uh, so what's happening in this example? I have my CPU, okay, uh, where the actions will happen. Uh, there is this program counter, etc., which tells you which instruction you are at, etc. Uh, so in the logical address space, so this is your assembly code, okay? It doesn't play with the physical addresses. It doesn't know it because this is totally unknown to the developer, code writer. It will be very random numbers in the physical memory. So it just uses the uh, logical memory stuff like jump to 16. So what ha is happening here is actually you have uh, int x, int y, compare something. Uh, and move this uh, value into register one, then move this into register two, then add register one and two, and write the result to register three. 
and then go back to this instruction again and repeat. So there is some kind of a for loop here, while loop here. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is actually, yeah, so let's make all of them big. Uh, so what happens is, uh, okay, once CPU started execution, what is the difference between, uh, okay, so once you start this program, so this these instructions are always on in this on this right because after all they make your program. But when you double click on it, now you move it as a whole, as a block, into the physical memory where the base is twenty or twenty or twenty, I guess yes. So memory management unit of the OS operating system converts the logical address twenty eight, which is here into physical address of uh, 24 is the base and it would be 52 so yeah that int x is now at 52 in main memory during execution yeah actually this is about it and what happens in the cpu side actually if you look at here in the cpu so once you move this uh, logical address space into physical address space, then you need some base value which is stored in CPU at all times, as long as this process is scheduled to run in the CPU. So 24, you must remember this. Also the size of the block, which is 32. Yeah, and IR here is the instruction, okay? Instruction. Uh, so yeah, it is, whatever instruction being executed, it is written here. Memory management is continuing then. Hardware device that at runtime maps virtual, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I we need this conversion that maps the logical or virtual, same thing, uh, address into physical address. Uh, in the previous simple example, we used one relocation register. So it is called relocation register base. Uh, and there are also other schemes around. Uh, so the user program deals with the logical addresses as expected. So you have a you have an array, you just treat that array as a consecutive block. So this is what I mean by user deals with logical addresses. It never sees the real physical addresses. It doesn't have to. And so this is like abstraction. Execution time binding occurs when reference is made to location in memory. Yeah, because now you need to get to the physical address because after all, you need to use your transistors, etc., your hardware to go there and get the correct instruction. And logical address is bound to physical address at that time. Okay. Yeah. Let's go visual. Okay. To keep things even more clear. Uh, so. Ah, uh, Hojong, one small question. Does it mean that every process will then have its own uh, base number? Yes, it does okay. mean that exactly. Uh -huh. Okay, Hojong. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, so, for instance, here. Uh, what's happening? Dynamic relocation using a relocation register. Yeah. So uh, this process, whatever it is, has this uh, base number of fourteen thousand. Okay. Uh, and uh, you happen to access the logical address of three hundred and forty-six. Then operating systems memory management unit just adds this constant to whatever current logical state is and then goes to the memory with that uh, output. Yeah, so let's talk about another memory management idea. So, so far we have seen one idea where I move a given process directly 
in to memory as a uh, as as one block. Okay. So in swapping, assume temp programs are loaded into memory and memory is filled up. Okay, it can happen. A process can be swept temporarily out of memory to a backing storage like a disk, uh, and then brought back into memory for the continued execution. So we are having some swapping because of the lack of space in memory. So this is started if more than a threshold amount of memory is allocated. Okay, so you don't trigger this at all times. Uh, and once you have a lot of memory at your disposal, then you disable this action, this swapping action. So what happens is actually uh, in the main memory where again your OS code also lives, we also have this user space code. This is the kernel space, blue part, and we are more involved with the uh, gray space, the user space. So P1 is swept out and written to a storage like a disk and P2 is swept in. Okay, so it's actually, it is not a very sophisticated idea, very uh, regular idea, uh, not a big deal. Uh, so continuous or contiguous allocation is that, is what we are talking about, we have been talking about actually. Allocate physical space that is equal to the process's logical address space. Uh, and uh, as we see from here, the whole main memory has actually two partitions. One is for the operating system, usually, usually held in the low memory with an interrupt vector, uh, and the other part is the user process, for the user processes. And the relocation registers are used to protect uh, user processes from each other because they have their own relocation registers uh, uh, and also you, you will never be accessing the addresses in the kernel space okay so these register values are set uh, nicely so that these uh, conflictions and these violations never happen base registers uh, contains value of the smallest physical address yeah, as we have seen. Uh, and then we do some offsets. So we add stuff to that. So we never subtract stuff from that. Limit register, the size register, contains range of logical addresses. Uh, yeah, so logical address must be less than the limit register to prevent overshooting. And memory management unit maps logical addresses dynamically. Uh, so, you have a logical address space to deal with in your CPU, in your current instruction, you happen to access memory. So, you are probably executing an instruction on an array, for instance, okay? And your array, you need to get some value from memory. So, this can be cache memory or main memory. Don't worry about it. After all, you need the physical address. So, for instance, so Let's, not for instance, let's continue. With logical address, uh, I come here and see whether uh, it, it is uh, less than the uh, limit register. So it is within bounds. If not, then there is an error. It means that like you have a array of size 20 and you want to access index 25 okay so it is bigger than the uh, size uh, so you throw an exception and stop actually let the operating system handle this exception but in general we have a good uh, logical address then we just add the space register to that and with that we go to the physical uh, memory Okay, so this slide uh, actually depicts better, even better, about this blockage idea. So, in the current snapshot, I have three processes uh, in the user space, and I always have this OS. So, process 8 finishes, so it means that I have this 
space available, then nine can come here, and then ten even can come here, etc. After a while, we see partitions, some of which are empty. Okay. So for instance, actually we don't see it here, but maybe later if you have five terminated, then you have partitions like the holes. I have one gray and second gray. And the fragmenter, the task of it is to collect those gray parts all together. Because currently, even if you have a process of this size, okay, like uh, start from the end of the gray and come to the middle of process 10, uh, so it doesn't fit to this gray hole. But if you have this thing also gray, it still doesn't work for you. So you have to put these grays together, which is called fragmentation. Um, yeah, so what is this talking about? Multiple partition allocation. Uh, yeah, degree of multi-programming is limited by the number of partitions because each partition can start a new program. A hole is a block of available memory, okay? Uh, and they have various sizes and they are scattered throughout the memory. When a process arrives, it is allocated, it's allocated memory from a hole large enough to accommodate it, large enough, okay? And process exiting frees its partition and adjacent free partitions are combined. If, if they are adjacent, then you just treat it as one big partition. But if they are not adjacent, again, you need to run a, a different a kernel procedure called fragmentation. Operating system maintains information about the allocated partitions as well as the free partitions, the holes. Now there are some questions here, some algorithmic parts here. How to satis satisfy is not a word. How to satisfy uh, a request of size n from a list of free holes? So we have three strategies. First fit is just look at all the uh, holes and when you see the first hole, look at all the partitions. Sometimes those partitions are allocated, so skip it. But when you hit the first free partition, just stop and put it there. Best fit is different. Allocate the smallest hole that is big enough. Okay, so it is um, like uh, more conservative because uh, you will make the best out of the holes, okay? So you will just uh, disable uh, the smallest hole that is big enough. because It should be big enough already because I need that space to execute. But I also want to, because probably once I put it into that hole, uh, that free hole, there will be some empty parts remaining, and that empty parts will probably not be able to accommodate any more uh, processes, right? Uh, that's why I want to minimize that uh, remaining empty hole, which is called the best fit idea. So it will produce the smallest left overall, yes. And worst fit is the opposite idea, it produces the largest left overall. So here it assumes that your process is like more smaller, okay? So you are likely to get the next process is likely to be a bigger process. So I better leave uh, largest ho holes behind. Yeah, I'll locate the largest hole that is big enough to uh, start that process. So you need to search the entire list here. Again, search the entire list. Even in the first fit, you need to search the entire list of partitions. Yeah. And uh, there will be useless holes that cannot accommodate any process continuously. Yes, as we discussed frequently. Uh, and this fragmentation business is about shuffling the holes, uh, shuffling memory content to place all three memory together in one large block. Okay, uh, this is the idea. And this is 
fragmentation by default we mean external fragmentation which is what we are talking about internal is uh, similar actually it is about um, the uh, uh, every process comes with some metadata this is about holding them okay so it is not directly related to the processes so this is not very important because it deals with small uh, chunks already the external fragmentation idea however you should uh, understand it now let's proceed uh, more uh, so when to take a break let's decide on a stopping point so where are we going uh, i don't know where are we going but we will stop at some point uh, let's do a couple of more slides uh, then we can stop um, ah, okay actually this is a very nice place uh, a, a milestone because now we are going to a different memory management idea so we have so far seen putting things as a whole as a one block consecutive block into memory and we have also seen the swapping action which is not a big deal it is like use a disk for swapping out so we have so far seen two strategies now the third one is the best one actually the paging so this is used for implementing virtual memory actually um, so virtual memory i mean i mean the following it is uh, it is a concept where you allow a program whose size is bigger than the physical memory okay so for instance you have a pc of 8 gigabytes but you want to run a video game uh, like quake or something a big one with the graphics etc it requires 16 gigabytes so with the previous schemes the non-paging schemes like putting everything as one package you can't run that video game because there is no 16 gigabytes at your disposal in your physical memory you just have 8 gigabytes but with the paging idea we have this something called virtual memory uh, which is <clears throat> a non-contiguous non-consecutive storage idea <clears throat> uh, and it allows you to run programs whose size is bigger are bigger than the current physical memory size and also you don't really need to deal with the fragmentation because you will not put everything as a whole you will just put it part by part into your uh, physical memory also known as the frames into the physical memory frames and they don't have to be consecutive so hence you don't need any type of fragmentation uh, and yeah so this allows uh, the address spaces to be non-continuous, uh, non-consecutive. Hence, we have a high utilization of memory space. We can use uh, almost everywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, let, let's give our break now because apparently we started this paging business. So uh, let's start a new uh, session with that uh, a clean session so i will stop the recording of the current one then